so my first question for you is just to get a general background on the history of flash flooding here in Oregon. I know about the deadliest flood in history in 1903, but can you give me some background on, let's say, the most recent um, bad flash flood, for lack of better words, but the 1996 flood? Yeah, I, I would say the 1996 flood was probably the most widespread um, and uh, impactful flood that we've had um, in recent memory. We did have some flooding in April of 2019 in the Willamette Valley. So you might remember we had a, a rain, a kind of a weak late season atmospheric river event, which is basically just a powerful rainstorm. And it occurred in conjunction with uh, some rapid snowmelt. And so reservoirs with uh, within the Willamette Valley River system were nearing their capacity and had to pass the flow downstream. And so, you know, there's a place, for instance, in Corvallis that, uh, you know, experienced some minor flooding and a few other places, you know, Harrisburg and Albany and stuff like that. And so that was probably, um, you know, one of the more impactful ones in recent memory. Although um, I will also note that in Burns this year in March, um, we had um, in the Sylvies River, we also had some uh, rapid snow melt. So they had a really great uh, snowpack this year out in um, the higher elevations of eastern Oregon and the Cascades too. But the um, the river, Sylvies River, there was a rapid snow melt event and the Sylvie River um, you know, rose rapidly and then a levee failed and it flooded the town, uh, parts of the town of Burns. And so I think it fled as something like 85 homes. Fortunately, um, I don't believe that any, anyone died from that, but it did, um, it was obviously very impactful for that, uh, for that city as well. And I mean, there are, you know, a number of historic floods that we think about. Um, one of the worst ones was all the way back in 1861. And <clears throat> that, in, uh, that flood actually, um, the weather conditions that caused that flood actually impacted the whole Western U S. So even down into the Sacramento Valley. And that one was probably one of the worst floods that we've had um, in our recorded history. And um, it was definitely considered one of the worst Willamette Valley floods there. And it was also kind of this thing that was a rain on snow events, kind of like what happened in 2019, except there's much more, there's much more water associated with it. And in 1861, we didn't have our system of dams and levees that helped protect us from that flooding. And so there was a lot of flooding like all up and down um, the Willamette Valley, uh, Portland, Salem, uh, Shampui, which used to house our um, uh, state capital for a short amount of time, flooded. And so, um, the other one was the 1894 flood in Portland, which might be a little more um, relevant for you. And so that was considered the worst flood in Portland's recorded history. And the high water marks that that set actually were used by the Army Corps of Engineers to design the height of the levees um, within the Columbia River and Willamette System confluence there. Uh, and you know, even though Portland did not have very many people at the time, um, it was the city was completely flooded or, you know, all the low lying areas were flooded and downtown was uh, flooded quite a lot. And it took several weeks for them to recover from that. Um, but yeah, that, uh, that 1903 flood in Hefner, I think is the, you know, so that was considered the second worst flood in actually the second deadliest flood in United States history. Um, so 247 people died and, um, yeah, so, and that one is actually caused by something quite different. So in Eastern Oregon, um, we have had flash floods that are not too much unlike the one that happened in Texas recently, where you get this uh, thunderstorm, just a, this incredibly juicy thunderstorm at the right place at the right time. And so there are cities and things in Eastern Oregon, small towns, that are in steep canyons alongside a creek, which serves as a water supply. And, um, you know, many of these towns didn't have any flood control to speak of, no dams upstream to, to get the water. So it, that's what happened in Hepner in 1903, was we had a, a very intense thunderstorm and it had a lot of hail, um, had several inches of rain in a short period of time. And there, uh, and and at that time, there's no warning system. There are no telephones. There's no way to get the word out that this was happening, and so, um, yeah. And so it 
uh, was one, and it still remains the worst natural disaster in Oregon's recorded history. And so obviously it was 1903, there was no way for them to warn people, but yeah. like, if that situation were to happen in the near future at some point, especially over in Eastern Oregon with those, as you said, those juicy, those large thunderstorms, um, what would the emergency response be in that point? Do, would they be sending out flash alerts basically saying like, go to higher ground? How is that conveyed now compared to obviously when there were no alerts back then? Yeah, so we do have an alert system. I, I mean, the big one of the biggest um, things that we have now that we didn't have 100 years ago is the weather service. And so they are, you know, 24-7, 365 days a year. They look out for conditions like this. And as best as they can, they try to anticipate this and to give whatever warning is possible. So even a few hours or something. And so they will issue um, either flood watches or warnings or flood emergencies. And those messages are supposed to go to local emergency management officials. And so that can in include anyone from the sheriff's office to uh, county emergency management offices or city, um, you know, whatever emergency management structure is, is in a lot of these places. And those uh, uh, officials have emergency management plans. And so if they anticipate a flood like this, they will initiate a series of things. So um, obviously you want to, um, you know, stage uh, rescuers, you want to get the word out. Um, also, what happens is that when you get these flood warnings or flood emergencies, is now we have cell phones, and um, if you've opted into it, they can provide those emergency warnings to you. And I highly recommend people opt into that um, into that structure. You know, even though you might get, a, you know, there's it's possibly a false alarm, but I'd rather have a false alarm at three in the morning than no alarm and uh, and have to be evacuated or whatever. So that's what's um, that's what's happened in place now. And you know, it's because um, we don't get these events very often. People are kind of rusty at it, and sometimes you don't know what to do when it happens. And so that's always an um, a struggle with trying to warn people of you know emergencies that have a high likelihood but maybe not a hundred percent chance of happening um yeah so, so i do want to ask um what areas are, are most prone to those flash floods here in oregon i know you're talking about eastern oregon but also here over in western oregon too where are the most prone areas and what causes a lot of the weather events that trigger these fl flash floods yeah so there are a variety of so I'll start with the weather events and then I'll circle back to where the maybe some vulnerable areas are. So the weather events that typically cause most of our historic floods, um, you know, uh, the worst ones are probably caused by, you know, what we call atmospheric river events. And these are, you know, basically especially juicy rainstorms that come in off the Pacific, um, oftentimes during the winter or spring. And usually the most impactful um, atmospheric river events occur during a wet year. So the ground's already saturated. There's a lot of snowpack in the mountains. And so you're basically raining onto a landscape that cannot um, soak in that water. And so it just runs off freely. Uh, atmospheric river events are also typically warmer than normal storms. And so, you know, you get these um, way above freezing temperatures high up in the mountains where we have a lot of snowpack. And so if that combination, that warm rain onto a snowpack can rapidly melt it and send that water downstream very fast. And that's, um, you know, probably one of the, you know, the things that are the most worrisome or, you know, the, the kind of system that we expect most of these flash floods. Um, we also get um, increasingly now because we have so many more wildfires, there are a lot more um, patches of, of forest and things up in the mountains that cannot soak in the rain as well. And so those um, areas will experience more runoff into the nearby streams and creeks and low-lying areas. And so typically when it rains a lot, you know, the ground soaks some of it in or it slows it down. This slows the runoff down so that the rivers or creeks don't rise as rapidly. And what we're seeing now is that there's a lot more of grounds that um, basically 
cannot soak that in because it's been burned recently. And so that water will run off much quicker into the creek. So you get these much uh, more rapid rises, especially on smaller creeks in burned watersheds. And so that's a, um, obviously one of the biggest um, things that we worry about. And the second thing obviously is in Eastern Oregon it associated with these, you know, thunderstorms uh, during this uh, early or you know, spring and summer, you can get an especially juicy thunderstorm and, you know, um, a narrow canyons and things like that. Uh, that's, um, and because Eastern Oregon is more semi-arid, there's, uh, the soil is less able to soak up that, you know, if you get a heavy rain event, it can, it just can't soak up the water very well. And so it just runs off and the topography or um, landscape in Eastern Oregon is very steep. So you get a lot of these big mountains and, and steep um, catchments. And so whenever rain falls there, it runs off very quickly into, into the rivers and, and creeks around there. So what is, uh, if you're able to explain, what does cause all these uh, extreme weather events that we're starting to see more and more, especially those juicy thunderstorms as we were talking about? I know over the past couple of years, I don't think 10 years ago I'd ever heard of an atmospheric river. Now I'm hearing about it every winter. Can you explain why we keep seeing these extreme weather events? Yeah, so uh, I mean, a lot of it is just natural variability. So we've experienced these sort of things in the past um, as part of our natural storm cycles. And, you know, we get these like, you know, slow, uh, slow time period um, cycles too in um, our storm events. So we'll have like years where it's really wet that tend to cluster together and then years that are really dry that cluster together. And that's always been kind of a part of our natural um, cycle. However, um, we are starting to uh, see in, his, um, in our observational data that the heaviest rain events that we do get are tend to be heavier than they used to be. And this is a consequence of climate change. Um, so as the globe warms, the air is able to hold more water, uh, water vapor, it's able to hold more moisture, and that gets released in, uh, by, in, in storms through rain. And so um, some of these storms are, you know, maybe have, they may have occurred like they have in the past, but they're just uh, more juicier now, if, you, if that term sticks with you. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, is there anything else that you think we may have missed during this interview that people should know about these weather events that cause flash floods, how people can prepare for these flash floods and anything else that you think we may have missed during this interview? Yeah. So, you know, flooding is kind of a, a hazard that we've always had to endure in Oregon um, and, you know, in the Willamette Valley, especially the, um, you know, some of our worst events have occurred decades ago um, when our flood control system was not as prepared to deal with that. And one thing to note is that, you know, we do have a better prepared flood control system at this time than we than we used to. And so that's part of the reason we're not seeing very many deadly uncontrolled floods um, or floods in general like we used to. However, with that said, is that this danger is not um, this risk is always there. And so even though we haven't experienced a big flood, you know, in the past, maybe two decades or so, depending on where you're at, it doesn't mean that that risk has gone away. So, um, you know, we have, you know, we've been dealing more and more with droughts, but, you know, these, like I said before, these, you know, there are kind of these natural cycles of precipitation and dry periods. Right now, we seem to be more in, in a, a dry period, but we will come back into a wet period again, and we will experience, um, you know, we will have this experience again of flooding. Hopefully it's not deadly like um, like this one. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time preparing for it. Um, and, you know, it is um, it is really important to keep prepared for it because, like I said earlier, as the climate has, has changed and we anticipate it will change more um, such that our most extreme rainstorms will be uh, will drop more precipitation than they used to. And so we might have more of a challenge you know, our system will be challenged again. And it's just a matter of when. And as far as people, um, you know, keeping uh, being prepared for it, it's, um, it's just, you know, it's more and more people now know if they live in a floodplain, because when you buy a house, um, that sort of information is, is provided to you and whatever. And so just following the usual steps for being prepared for floods. And the biggest thing is to be prepared for uh, rapid evacuation. Um, so you want to, 
have a way of being prepared. You want to keep your eye on the weather. If it looks, you know, if it looks like there's a big storm coming is to make sure that you have multiple ways of receiving evacuation notices and that you keep your eyes on the weather because the, you know, one of the tragic things about the Texas incident was it happened in the middle of the night. And, um, you know, it is really hard to get information out in the middle of the night like that. And so not only being prepared for yourself, but also help your neighbors out, help your community out and, you know, know where your evacuation routes are um, and know how, you know, just have a plan in place to uh, get out.